Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another week here at the Damage Board with me, Johnny Roll, and our special guest appearing this week only, host of the Bituation Room, Francesca Fiorentini, and her dragon. Hi, hey everybody, how's it going? If you are listening as a podcast, I am an adorable dragon made by High Anxiety Dragon Girl. That is an awesome, awesome dragon. So cool. I love the little white mohawk. I know. That's awesome. No, I love it. No, we have very Bernie. Characters. It is actually. I wonder if that's what it is. Anyway, thank uh, you. Glad high to have anxiety you here. Girl. Yeah. Um, how was the bituation room yesterday? How'd that go? Oh, it was amazing. Thank you for asking. We had Kim Kelly, who just wrote a new book called Fight Like Hell, the Untold History of American Labor, and looking at all these like awesome sort of women, people of color, the disabled, like all the sort of usually more marginalized communities and stories that have like made waves in American labor history. So please check that out. Awesome. And obviously comedian James Fritz, who's just hilarious. So it was, it was a good time. Awesome, that sounds like fun. Well, you know what? We're gonna have a little fun of our own. It's sure. a Monday, we're gonna start things off a little bit light and watch Trevor Noah make fun of pretty much everybody and get some good laughs, but much more importantly, have some jokes that did not receive much in the way of laughter, which I think <laughs> says so much about the people in the room at the White House Correspondents Dinner, and I love it. I want to eat it up. And then we've got terrible candidates. We've got imaginary candidates. We've got leftists being blamed for past elections and probably future elections too. And an absolutely insane Karen in Sephora. So we got a lot to talk about. We need everyone to buckle up, hold on to your butts. And also, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button so that people know we're live, that would be great. You can send us comments, sweet super chats, and all that. And we'll respond as we go. Early heads up, the fun will continue after our full program because every Monday for our YouTube members, we make a top 10 list. Sometimes political, sometimes not. Uh, this one's a political one, arguably. We're going to be giving our evidence behind the, our list of the top 10 dumbest politicians. So oh, that's going to so be hard. a lot of fun. When they're sending their politicians, they're not sending their best, <laughs> you'll find. Um, but anyway, with all that said, Franny, you ready to start this thing off? Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's start with this, in fact. Interesting fact, even as first lady, Dr. Biden continued her teaching career. Yeah, the first time a presidential spouse has ever done so, ever. Congratulations. Now, you might think it's because she loves teaching so much, but it's actually because um, she's still paying off her student debt. I'm sorry about that, Jill. <laughs> yeah, I guess you should have voted for Bernie. Okay, so that was Trevor Noah at the White House Correspondents Dinner. And I think overall he did a pretty good job. We're gonna be showing you more of that. Um, there was definitely laughter in the room for the, you know, pointing out that Bernie would have canceled his student loan debt and Biden hasn't. And oh, that's your husband that could do that any day and she's not to. It, it, I felt like it was a little bit of uncomfortable laughter, Francesca. What do you think? That's the point. That's the point of roasting mm -hmm. somebody, especially roasting a politician. And I gotta say, Biden sitting for the White House press correspondence dinner. It's a low bar for what I was hoping out of a Biden administration at this point. What, that but he I'll, would show up? <laughs> exactly, the fact that he would take it and go that like Trump had not, whatever, it's fine. I think it's mm -hmm. hilarious, just the ability as a comic to tell Jill Biden you should have voted for Bernie is just like, mm, oh. Oh, a little like all parts of yeah. me are excited about that. It is, uh, and look, I, 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 he did the sort of job he's supposed to, mocking the media, mocking the politicians. He did both, and we're gonna get to more in just a minute. Um, it, but that joke, I think, summarizes for a lot of people what makes them uncomfortable about this. Not Trevor Noah specifically, but that he's doing the best he can. He can't cancel student loan debt. Trevor Noah can't, you know, sign an executive order. But like, all he gets to do is make a joke about how. Like sitting at that table is a guy who could do a massive amount of help to literally millions of people. And maybe he will, but for now, he's just choosing not to. He could do it, he just won't do it. And so like it's comedy is all you have as a weapon in that. But the stakes are so real for so many people and everyone else in the room, the people that would prefer that those jokes not be made because they wanted Biden to get elected. I don't know, it's just, it's uncomfortable that they side with so much like casual obstruction of very necessary government help. Well, they weren't laughing because a lot of them probably don't have student debt. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them are making millions just, yeah. and millions of dollars. Not everybody, obviously, 
who was in that room. But I think you understand that obviously this, the White House press correspondence center is elites on elites. And so it's just mm -hmm. sort of like elites making fun, light jabs at one another. And so it is fun to see the stuff you and I would laugh at. Uh, and if that room were yeah. full of like real people, um, that we would laugh at a lot of different things. I mean, and and also there's a little bit of like a lowest common denominator, like the easiest, the dumbest jokes got the biggest laugh. Like Definitely. he opened with like, I'm gonna be doing some jokes tonight. And everyone's like, ah, that's funny, cause he is. <laughs> He's a comedian. You're like, all right, yeah. you guys. Yeah. Well, now uh, I know why we you don't have enough comedy on your news channels, cause you don't exactly. actually understand it. No, no, you're not inherently funny at all. Um, but we have a nice little mashup of a few jokes um, calling out uh, both politicians and media. It should be fun. Let's take a look at this. Don't forget, he's also had some major legislative successes. You know, in his first year in office, I might add. You know, he got a bipartisan infrastructure bill passed that would do everything from fixing America's roads and bridges to modernizing school buses, which Matt Gates's girlfriend is very excited about. <laughs> Don't boo love. Yeah, I might roast you gently, you know, like a pair of testicles on a Tucker Carlson special, but I'm not, I'm not doing this just for the attention, all right? I'm a comedian, not Kirsten Cinema, all right? And by the way, give it up for Kirsten Cinema. Who ever thought we'd see the day in American politics when a senator could be openly bisexual but closeted Republican, huh? That's progress. That's progress. So yeah, I liked, I liked all of that, um, and. Look, he gets to point out things that they will do their little nervous laughter or whatever, but they don't like how many people in that room love Kirsten Cinema. They love the, no. the role that she serves at least, if not the actual person that she is. And it's very easy, the lowest common denominator is like the Matt Gates stuff. Like most people in the media are gonna laugh at Matt Gates, but I'm here for the, the cinema stuff. I'm here for that because it's it's so much more real. And and he's vocalizing the feeling that so many of us have where we're just I well, I guess we're stuck with this. I guess she's found a loophole. You can just lie. Get into office and then for six years, you can just block anything from happening. Isn't that, and there's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do in the meantime, isn't that amazing? I mean, that's a solid joke there because it is also a kind of a dig at closet Republicans who mm -hmm. are home, at once homophobic, but also closeted gay. So there was a little bit of more going on there. And I also like, I, I, the thing about cinema that people are laughing at, it's like nobody feels sensitive about that because nobody likes Kirsten Cinema. Not even the Republicans whose bidding she's doing like her. Like Mitch McConnell did not even really turn around when she wanted yeah. him to watch her vote down a $15 minimum wage. Like. So yeah. that's what's great about the cinema stuff. And also, I'm glad, obviously, like I thought Trevor Noah, I don't always love him on The Daily Show. I thought he crushed this. I thought he did a good job. Mm -hmm. Thought he was a good amount of biting, but also pleasant because once again, elites on elites. And they'll, yeah. you know, obviously, if you're a woman, it's very different. And if you're, you know, a, a black guy doing it, it's different. You get, you just get a different. Remember when Michelle Wolf talked about well, I remember. the eye makeup of Sarah Huckabee Sanders? And then it was like, oh, sick. Um, you know, so, and it wasn't just Republicans participating in that. It was also like liberals who were like, that was a little too far. Calm down. Yeah, when it was about Sarah Huckabee Sanders getting paid to repeatedly lie to the American people. No, but but you're still supposed to be nice to her. She's very respectable. She can be a governor. Uh, yeah, no, that was super annoying. And um, yeah, I don't I don't know if we're ever gonna get one that says as as honest as Michelle Wolf, but I thought that he did a good job. Again, I, I'm not like, I don't watch the Daily Show generally or anything like that, but I thought he did a good job um, in not just making it the easy stuff, the attacking Sean Hannity or whatever. There was plenty of that. Um, and maybe or we'll back to Trump, books, like but. making it not yeah. just focused on Trump, I thought was like, it's like, oh, that's what the Democrats aren't doing is, mm -hmm. you know, focusing on the new problems, not just Trump. Yeah. So, yeah, that and was, focusing on the problems that are of their own creation. Not listening to James Carville to don't tell me what Biden hasn't done. Don't <laughs> tell me what Biden has done. Tell everyone what Biden hasn't done. Maybe maybe he'll do it. Probably not. But that's our best chance is if we focus on what he hasn't done. Now that said, um, he wasn't the only person uh, that got to speak. Let's uh, let's transition into uh, Joe Biden's little routine. I'm really excited to be here tonight with the only group of Americans with a lower approval rating than I have. <laughs> it's the first time the president attended this dinner in six years. It's 
It's understandable. We had a horrible plague, followed by two years of COVID. <laughs> we're here to show the country that we're getting through this pandemic. Plus, everyone had to prove they were fully vaccinated and boosted. So if you're at home watching this and you're wondering how to do that, just contact your favorite Fox News reporter. They're all here, vaccinated and boosted, all of them. I think a lot of people noticed the Peter Ducey look there, and uh, this was Skittleski did the best summary of that look to camera. I love that Peter Ducey just knew. Oh, <laughs> that's true. Oh no! <laughs> and he had they had done reaction shots of Peter Ducey at one point. They'd made a joke about how Fox is always like we have to you know keep tabs on Hunter Biden because he's he's making like a, a, a killing off of his uh, you know family name and they made a joke about Peter Ducey and he like smiled and waved at the camera but for this one he's like oh no it's true <laughs> so look Biden isn't a professional comedian or anything uh, and he did ruin a few jokes yeah. but those were okay i thought they were okay like like They're i okay. actually to be honest with you I'm happy he just landed some of them. Like mm -hmm. Biden is notorious for when he's trying to be funny off the cuff. It's like, oh no, grandpa anecdote coming up. All right, here we go. And yeah. you know, and then it's just, you know, 10 minutes later, you reach the point. So I salute him for being able to land some of those. I think we could have used a corn pop joke. And I also think <laughs> that Peter Ducey, like, Go harder on him because you guys have had a little tussle and everyone in that room knows it that you called him a stupid SOB. And so I just feel like, you know, lean into that yeah. a little. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, he, he he did okay. He's not like I remember Obama back in the day had some had some pretty good ones. He's a little bit better able to sell it, but Biden did what he can. Um, but, but I want to turn back to Trevor Noah briefly because there was a couple parts that I have not been able to find on video, but I, again, the the little jokes about like Sean Hannity and stuff, those are funny or Tucker Carlson, the ball tanning or everything. But um, but like these are people in the media that have a massive obligation. They get great perks, they get to go to these parties. A lot of them make a ton of money, not the actual reporters, but the people who get to go on TV do. Um, and so we should expect a lot of them. So he talked about them and also about their obligations. So this first quote, he says, I love the New York Times, I really do. You guys are the best. You do some of the most accurate, precise reporting and news. You never fail to write down exactly whatever the police have given you to say. Really powerful. <laughs> Is it just me or does the New York Times keep blaming bail reform on crimes that had nothing to do with bail reform? I'm half expecting to open your newspaper and see a headline, Mets blow four run lead due to changes in state bail laws. And that's that's real. They do just, and, and it's not just the New York Times, obviously, the vast majority of both video as well as print news just takes those press releases from the cops. And um, we all, I like the problem has only become really crystallized, really transparent recently because of footage that people take on their their phones. We know multiple high profile uh, cases, including George Floyd. Initially, the press uh, the press release that goes to the media and is uncritically reported is 100% a lie about what actually happened. Yeah, and they there doesn't seem to be a lot of learning on the part of the media. Maybe because they like having that close close relationship with the cops. Maybe they need the connections. I don't know. That yeah, that joke did not get a laugh in the room. Gonna be real, but it would have <laughs> again if the, if normal people had been there who understand just how biased the media is in favor of cops, how much copaganda they spin, and they also probably didn't laugh because they were yeah they felt they felt touched. They felt oh my god, but we're the New York Times, but like yeah, you you have you know even people like Ezra Klein, like formerly of Vox, who who's like. Like obsessed with crime stats, obsessed with like mm -hmm. surges in crime and like any little bump in a surge in crime after like decades of a down, like a, a downturn in any violent crime. Now, after the pandemic, you've got a, cer a, a little bump in certain areas and it's like, oh, no, 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 call in all the dogs. And it, again, it's all just bolstering someone like Eric Adams, like pro cop agenda. So I'm glad he said that. I love when mm -hmm. jokes are actually sometimes just for the person telling them and mm -hmm. a few people who get it. Like that shows a little bit like, I'm just not here to crowd please. Yeah, yeah, it's like, and the other people that, that it's there are not the ones in the room, really. Yes, 
Um, totally. Anyway, there was one other, and this is this is part of his closing comments. He says, honestly, ask yourself this question. If Russian journalists who are losing their livelihoods, as you were talking about, Steve, and their freedom for daring to report on what their government is doing, if they had the freedom to write any words, to show any stories, or to ask any questions, if they had basically what you have, would they be using it the same way that you do? Ask yourself mm -hmm. that question every day because you have one of the most important roles in the world. And obviously, no, they wouldn't be using it in any of these ways, uh, probably. I don't know, maybe they would be co-opted by the money and the glitz and the ac access and all that too eventually. Um, but no, it's, you know, our, our, sometimes they do good work in the media. Like if you define that really broadly, sometimes the New York Times or the LA Times or maybe CNN will have a documentary series or whatever. But um, But for the most part, no, probably not, probably not. What, as have, people always say, when was the last time you saw someone who makes minimum wage on CNN? Honestly, so final no, thoughts. I mean, I mean, in terms of like, I just had a labor, you know, labor reporter on Kim Kelly, and like, she does not get asked by mainstream news outlets to cover, you know, yeah, you you might have Chris Smalls on to talk about the Amazon uh, labor union, but that'd be it. You know what I mean? Just give us one face, one leader, and then we won't talk about anything. We won't talk about striking coal miners. We won't talk about any of that other sure. stuff. And he, and I think Trevor Noah could have gone a little bit harder on the fact that like every single like political, I think this week had a piece out that was like, oh, the the glamour and glitz of covering the White House is suddenly gone. Everyone's, it's a little boring around here. And it's just like, oh, boo effing who, like mm -hmm. just- Then leave. Uh, Exactly. Then at least, oh, you have to actually do your job, and it's not just salacious, weird reporting about you know some new angle of corruption from the Trump administration. Just yeah. do your job. Talk about issues then, and like if if you think it's boring, well then find a way to frame it so that people do pay attention. That's what we do here on the show. That's what you do it every yeah, single damn day. Yeah, and by the way, the news is not just about what's happening. It's not just about Trump, like. Having a bizarre stream of consciousness on his way to to the helicopter. If mm -hmm. Biden isn't saying crazy things, good. Those are, in a very real sense, a distraction, intentional or not. So mm -hmm. talk about what's not happening at the White House, which is everything. <laughs> Nothing is actually happening there. <laughs> that itself is news, since he has a duty to lead and he's made specific promises. Cover that. Anyway, with that said, we're going to take our first break. We come back. Another uh, accusation of sexual assault against a candidate. We're going to break that down in a lot more after this. Yeah, in the chat, we were talking about who was there and who wasn't. I don't think there were some good lines about Laura Ingram. Like he said, Oh, Laura Ingram, what is there to say about Laura Ingram that the Anti Defamation League hasn't already said? <laughs> <laughs> Which was is that good. Biden? I don't think she Biden? was there. No, I think that was Trevor Noah. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think that she I mean, his was. line um, about. Fox being a Waffle House, like during the day, it's pretty much okay, and then at night it becomes insane. I thought that was spot on yeah. and so funny. I think I think he said a drunk woman named Janine is a uh, like <laughs> promising Wants to fight, to fight all the Mexicans. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. that was pretty good. Anyway, now we got to move into much more serious stuff. This is not a joke, even if the Republicans would like it to be. Let's start off with this. We're going to take sex education out of the schools and put it back in the homes where it belongs. Yeah, that seems like a weird, awkward place for the sex education. Uh, but anyway, that is Republican gubernatorial candidate Charles Herbster, who doesn't want you to have much sex education. But we've been getting a recent education on some of his sexual assault, unfortunately, in this case. He has been facing accusations from multiple women. Over the weekend, a second woman has come forward and um, talked about the experience she had with Charles, Charles Herbster, who I will remind you has been endorsed by Donald Trump and who was defended by Donald Trump after the second woman came out with her experience. This is Elizabeth Todson. She alleges that she had been sexually groped by Herbster back in 2019 and said her experience had been thoroughly described in previous reporting by the Nebraska Examiner. So we know of some of the experiences of women who are as yet still anonymous. So we had known about what had happened to her. Now she is identifying herself. After all that came out, they have the rally, Trump's there. He calls Herbster a very good man who has been maligned. Trump says Herbster was innocent of what he called despicable charges and says, I defend people when I know they're good. A lot of people, they look at you and say, you don't have to do it, sir. I defend my friends. So he's told he doesn't need to defend this guy, but he has so much in common with him in terms of the assaults that I guess he feels he must. 
But it wasn't just Trump at the rally who was defending him. They had like a, a priest or something who decided to defend this guy in a really awful way. Take a look at this. This is a man of God. And we cannot even imagine what he's going through. This is bigger than just the governorship. This is a good man. This man, the things that have been said against him are ripping him at the soul. Okay, so the only person whose soul is being ripped is him. The accusations, and you can see that he's he's taking them very seriously because he got his hand his head bowed, and um, they're not worried about the the soul ripping that a politician, a person in a position of authority who is trusted, is going around sexually assaulting women in his own party. See him as a potential mentor, someone who it's important for them to know and work with a colleague. Instead, he's apparently a predator and he goes and violates multiple women. And when they come out knowing that they risk losing their political career to accuse a man, in this case of their own party of doing this, they're maligned publicly by religious figures, by the former president of the United States, Francesca. It is disgusting. I mean, and it's the Brett Kavanaugh playbook. You know, if someone accuses you of sexual assault, just cry big old crocodile tears, and you'll probably get away with it if you are wealthy and powerful and a white man. Sad to say, and it's true. And no other example of that could be truer than Donald Trump himself. And I think it is, you know, for as far back in the rearview mirror as sometimes it feels the Me Too movement is, it's not. And I think we have to thank. Donald Trump's election for a lot of women saying enough is enough. We cannot now elect an accused rapist to the highest office. And I'm gonna say something, you know what? I think it's time, I think it is time. And it, and I think that's what spurred it. So it's funny how this awful man can do that. But it also is funny the way the Republican Party, this is not obviously their first predator. I mean, mm -hmm. we remember the way Betsy DeVos basically turned like any kind of investigation into college campus rape on its head and tried to vindicate uh, those who had been accused of campus rape, right? As if that's the problem, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the problem on, uh, uh, on college campuses is that there's way too many false accusations of rape. We all know that, right? Everyone yeah. knows that, statistically that is true. And I am being completely facetious. So it is, it's like a gut punch when you remember this is a party that not just sweeps under the rug, this is a party that celebrates, that actually yeah. defends the predators. And you want that dude in your home telling you about sex ed? Yeah. No, no, no thank you. And, and that all their media will rally to defend these people. I mean, like, you know, I, we should perhaps be more specific. So this is Charles Herbster. And you might think, oh, well, wait, didn't you guys already talk about someone? Wasn't there allegation? You might be mixing it up with some other candidates because there's multiple candidates that have been endorsed by Donald Trump and others in the Republican establishment that they're not calling to resign. Uh, Herbster's one, uh, but of course, Trump had his own accusations. By the way, he's also endorsed Herschel Walker, who has allegations of spousal abuse. Sean Parnell, who had allegations of spousal abuse against another one of Trump's employees. And after they broke up after the allegations of abuse, Trump picked the abuser and then tried to get him elected. And Roy Moore as well, he stuck with him. So, but honestly, at this point, it would be very difficult to imagine a candidate who could have as many allegations of sexual assault and harassment as Donald Trump did. They will mm -hmm. always be at a lower level than him, a horrendous amount of just flagrant years of harassment and, and assault and all that. But like, it's not just that he ran, he did win and they've stuck with him. Why would we expect them to have higher standards for any of the others? They just don't care. By the way, we showed you the polls last week, literally asking Republican voters, is X an issue for you for a candidate? And for things as broad as homophobic comments, anti-Semitic comments, spousal abuse, it's not as big of a problem as it is for Republicans. This is not Francesca and I speculating. This is not a hypothesis about what will play. They say it to pollsters, it doesn't bother me that much if they are known for having beaten their wives and girlfriends. Yeah. Or in this case, sexual assault. I don't remember if they asked about that specifically, but but it, you're seeing it right now. Herbster is still a candidate. There are eight women who have accused him. 
the, the two that have come forward so far are women of his own party who have a lot to lose. And so they will do the Kavanaugh playbook. They'll say, well, these women are just trying to get famous, just trying to make a name for themselves. No, they stand to lose everything in terms of their career in uh, accusing Herbster of this. But they're still doing it, Francesca, and it's not having any effect. I mean, for me, it makes me think of the reckoning that is coming uh, with young Republicans who, like, you know, I believe are misguided and deluded and probably just assume the politics of their parents and are fairly well off. However, I've met a few young Republican women and you're like, babe, you deserve more. You know what I mean? And like, oh, I'm not, I'm not gonna work with you on your pro-life agenda or your anti-choice agenda. Um, but don't you see that like the Republican Party has been completely like running roughshod over women's rights, even when it comes to these kinds of issues? Don't you see how like immoral, ungodly, if you will, it is to do something like this? You know, this is the party that is now passing legislation that says it is illegal to get an abortion, even in instances of rape. And I was just looking up the other day, in many states, a rapist can claim paternity and 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 like have custody. Yeah. Over that child. So, like, what are we talking about here? So, it is not, it, and it, and like, it, look, it's not on me. I just don't, I can't stomach that kind of coalition building. But I would say to all of us to like understand that there is a bridge to be made with young Republican women and Republican women more generally, because they're really, they've been facing a crossroads, which is either go along with a misogynist party and shut up or have a minimal amount of autonomy and sovereignty, which, which, and so like, I don't know. I hope. I like literally. This is one of those moments where I'm like, I actually do want a better Republican Party with more women in leadership. A yeah. lot of them are like uh, Marjorie Taylor Green sort of animatronic um, meme lords, and uh, you know who are just sort of crazy for the sake of it. But maybe there's others out there. I don't well, know, and, John. And and look, like I try to imagine if I was like a 19 year old conservative woman and I was thinking about getting into politics or whatever. Who are your role models? Like right. even just on the female side, like is it someone like Marjorie Green who just I think it was yesterday said that there shouldn't be like a living wage or any aid for childcare because then women won't feel they need to get married because yeah. they'll have married the government. <laughs> um, like what, Candace Owens, Tommy Lauren. Megan Kelly, Jeanine Pirro, Laura Ingram, no. Ainsley Earhart. Are any of these women that are sending a strong message to young conservative women, don't put up with any of these guys BS if they abuse you? No, it is, you are supposed to be submissive. And so they get put in a really terrible position, one that I can't even imagine having to be in. They're not the only group in the Republican Party that if you're a legitimate conservative, you gotta be in the room with a lot of people who fundamentally hate you. Um, but this is what it is like, and can you be shocked? With all yeah. of what they say about feminism and about men and what makes men strong and everything, they're producing men like this. And you, you have like your best chance of making it as a Republican woman is to be an even more out front aggressive supporter of this. Yes. Those are the sorts of women that do well, like the Marjorie Greens and the Lauren Boberts. Yes, not the Liz Cheney's, right? You can't, no. you can't, no, that can't be your role model. You're not going in anywhere Carlson. with that. No, if you point it out, you are gone. That's it. Yes. Or what's her face from the the five? It's been so long now. Like I literally can't remember her name because she's been gone for so long. She was a brunette. They, she's on the five. They she, throw them down was, the memory shoot. She was popular. She Kimberly raised. Kimberly Guilfoyle. <laughs> no, it wasn't Kimberly Guilfoyle. I cannot believe that I'm blanking on her name. But she was on the five, and I think got outnumbered. And she made an accusation. Where's she been for like four or five years? Yeah. That's it. You're done. Your party wants you to shut up, that is it. And you better, if you wanna make it as a conservative woman, you better cross your fingers and hope that something like this doesn't happen to you, right? It is all about victim blaming. It is all about what it. What can you do to avoid being sexually assaulted? Not how yeah. can sexual assaulters and predators stop and be held accountable. Exactly. By the way, fascist killer is the name, but um, yes, thank you. It's uh, Andrea Santaros. Where's she? She was up and coming. They loved her. And then she made the accusation. And then that's it. Jesus. Anyway, um, okay, we are we are burning through this hour already. Um, anyway, you if you want to know more about the the accusations, they're out there. Maybe more of the, the women will come forward. They shouldn't have to. There's already multiple women who have been very specific at what happened. Nobody cares. Trump is not retracting his endorsement. Herbster's just calling it a lie. That's what they will do. That's what they will do. 
And um, lots of Republicans go along with this. Yeah, no, it's just a lie. They're just they're just trying to hurt you, and then you might find that it happens to you. Mm-hmm. That said, let's move to even more ridiculous endorsements. Take a look at this. That's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for one race. You know, we've endorsed Dr. Oz. We've endorsed JP, right? JD Mandel, and he's doing great. They're all doing good. They're. <laughs> I don't even know what to make of it. <laughs> JP, JD Mandel. <laughs> Where am I? What day is it? That is Donald Trump. <laughs> Talking about a guy that not only, I almost said J.D. Mandel, J.D. Vance is his name. Like he's endorsed him a couple months ago. He's already appeared with him before. Can't remember his name, just out there. He got Dr. Oz, he might or might not think that he's a wizard. But he remembers the name Dr. Oz, but with J.P. Mandel, he has no idea, Francesca. If you're Vance, what do you do with that? Do you even care at this point? Just one sad little tear in the shower. Like, I worked so hard. (laughs) He worked so hard. He He worked so hard to throw his former self slash his in, you know, his little subconscious under the bus, took down all the mirrors in his home. You wrote Hillbilly Elegy. Damn it. You know, (laughs) and like, and no, Trump, does he get his? Even I can't get that name out of my head. JD Vance, the it's pretty good now. name, not gonna lie. It's like Tim Apple. It's just, it just it sticks in there. It is uh, like exactly like Tim Apple. So look, the fact that he has no idea who the guy that he wants to be a senator is, that doesn't necessarily mean that his brain is rice pudding. It could be that he just has a particular issue with names. He has had a lot of trouble with names. I will say though that while I am uh, extending goodwill to him and just saying maybe he's got a thing with names. That is goodwill that he would never extend to like Joe Biden, for instance, when he has similar JD Mandel sort of issues or whatever. But it's not just that he messes up the name, it's to mess it up and put in the name of the guy that you are trying to destroy. That we found out last week, you're trying to destroy specifically because you think he has a disgusting sex life. Yes. That's why he chose not to go. With Josh Mandel. The Senate, I understand that nothing happens and that the Senate is a joke and all that, but in theory, it's supposed to be important. Maybe we could treat it with a little bit more expectation, a little bit more like hope that that will put people that we've actually vetted or, or thought about at least briefly in there. Lol. Yeah. It's, just, it's only gonna get worse. Oh, it's just gonna be a bunch of Tom Cotton replicas. That's it. Things are gonna get worse, John, what the hell? I know, well, look, the thing is, so we, we've been talking now about a few different candidates. So JD Vance is the most, it's second maybe to Tucker Carlson. It's the most see-through thing of a guy who didn't really seem to believe this stuff, but knew, oh, there's an appetite for that. I'd love to live in a mansion. So I'm just yeah. gonna say that stuff. And there's yeah. no expectations, there's no bar. They, they'll, the fact that it's directly contradicted by everything I used to say, no one will care. Uh, no, they don't care. And then uh, look at like Herschel Walker is, I saw a poll, he was up 10 points over Raphael Warnock. He can't get through an interview. Like even if you're discounting, which they all are, the fact that his wife has said that he physically abused her, which should be, that should just totally knock you out of the race, but it doesn't anymore, it's 2022, we don't have any standards. He clearly isn't prepared to be a senator, a a position of great responsibility, but Mm -hmm. he's leading. And I expect that if JD Vance does become the, the the nominee, he is, I think, the prohibitive favorite. There's no standards anymore for any of these positions, and it's at least a six-year position. We know that there's a massive incumbency advantage, and so we could be stuck with this guy for literally decades as he cosplays an insane MAGA guy. <sighs> anyway, by the way, little super fast update on the one that he did know. Dr. Oz has been dropped by Columbia. Uh, Columbia's Irvine, uh, Irving Medical Center no longer lists his personal page on its website. Um, and so I know a group of physicians had written to them saying that he had a disdain for science and evidence-based medicine, so they shouldn't ruin their reputation by being affiliated with them anymore. And apparently that might be working. Maybe it's having some consequences. I, 
He's doing, oh, he's got a, a little bit of support in the primary. I don't know if it's expected that, that he's gonna win, but no, it's just so it's a rogues gallery. You're Dr. Oz, you could spend the rest of your life selling supplements, but like mm -hmm. actually making money. You could have show after show. What's the next Quibi? CNN plus, yeah. I don't know, you could do it all. Why, why do you wanna be in the Senate? Yeah. Power, that's it, power. Yeah, power and maybe he thinks he can sell some more books or something, I don't know. Okay, with that said, we're gonna take our second break. Uh, when we come back, progressives are being already accused for ruining the Democrats' chances come November. But now in addition, they're being blamed for 2020, where the Democrats won, but they're being blamed for them not winning enough. We'll give you the details after this. Okay, with that said, we're gonna move into some more news starting with this. <laughs> I've always said if I can't go home and explain it, I can't vote for it. And that's why I oppose Build Back Better. For Alex Mooney and his out of state supporters to suggest David McKinley supported Build Back Better is an outright lie. David McKinley has always opposed reckless spending because it doesn't make sense for West Virginia. Alex Mooney has proven he's all about Alex Mooney, but West Virginians know David McKinley is all about us. I'm David McKinley and I approve this message. Okay, so uh, you know we have our Monday Menace because a lot of nonsense happens over the weekend. And now we gotta talk about Joe Manchin because there he is using the fact that he almost single-handedly destroyed the Democratic agenda so that he can weigh in in a Republican primary to help this candidate try to stop or try to take out a Trump backed incumbent. And somehow he's worried that the Republican is gonna be seen as supporting Build Back Better. So the Republican needs Joe Manchin's conservative cred by describing how he helped destroy it. And what? this is the guy that we have to hope is gonna let us you know, pass a climate bill or do more on infrastructure or elder care or education. These are his concerns. It's just, he's so powerful. He's so powerful, Francesca, it's real frustrated. I mean, it doesn't have to make sense to anyone but Joe Manchin's pocket, mm -hmm. that's it. It's just his bank account, is it growing? Did I get money for this endorsement? Tight, I don't care. Like he's not actually playing for the other team, he's just playing for team Manchin. And that is make the most amount of money in, the le in whatever life he's got left. And uh, yeah, rob the people of West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a and the yeah. rest of us and the world, and then and you, you know, along the way, of course. And uh, look, he also continues the the cover story for why he was against it. That if I can't understand, if I can't explain it, I won't vote for it. I'm not going to do reckless spending. Like it was paid for. It's paid for. He knows that he's paid for. And now he even if you can't explain it, you dumb. You're dumb. There's a very there's a case to be made that he is in fact dumb. Um, but smart when it comes to his own finances, he's done quite well for himself, and he's con continuing a life path that's gonna see him be uh, ever richer. But he said there that it wasn't paid for. We know that it what that it was paid for. There were gonna be tax increases on the wealthy, which he likes to pretend, by the way, sometimes he's in favor of. He came out just a couple of weeks ago and said, I would be in favor of raising the corporate tax rate, not to what it was at before Trump, to be clear, but several points higher. And then that allows Kirsten Cinema to then tag in, because this is a WWE performance that they're doing, to, to shoot it down and to stop it from happening. Um, but anyway, we've, we've occasionally gotten little updates throughout the year. And we always do what we think is our obligation to cover what might happen. So he'll come out and say, I'm in favor of a, an independent climate bill or whatever. Like he wants to do $500 like million dollars or something for climate. It's all BS, man. This is what the game is. He wants influence on the right. That's what he's selling. He, we gotta get rid of him. Yes. We need a good candidate to go against him. I understand that the obstacles of that are absolutely massive. And again, it's similar to what we were talking about earlier with cinema. It's you just get stuck with these people that don't represent their constituents. Remember, we were talking about how badly uh, dental care was needed in his state. The number of people who've like lost teeth because they don't have insurance coverage. Is he is he talking about that? No, he's off. He's off doing like uh, fundraisers 
with big Trump donors. He did that a couple of weeks ago. Now he's weighing in more in those primaries than the primaries on our side. It's just ridiculous. And his approval ratings really haven't taken a hit in Not West like Virginia. cinemas have. Not like cinemas have, absolutely. And obviously that's no. the nature of that state, right? It's much, it's definitely more of a red state. Um, but again, that's sort of where you're like, I don't know, somebody run against. <laughs> I don't know, or like, but again, it being a red state, that to me is not a good enough explanation. Mm. He is directly standing against aid to conservatives. This isn't like, come on, Joe Manchin, let us put up a, a massive AOC statue in your state. No, oh, he stopped it. No, this is like stuff that is bread and butter economic issues. He is hurting them, he's hurting their infrastructure. They're yeah. going to be incredibly harmed um, by climate change. We talked about the number of like uh, waterways and streams and things like that. They're gonna have significant problems as the climate gets worse and worse. They, they, there needs to be better, better communication specifically to West Virginia. I think that that was part yes. of the difference. In Arizona, I think that there were a lot of great groups that have done a lot of amazing work to make sure that people know what cinema is doing. And there have been attempts in West Virginia, you know, like the, um, the the Poor People's Campaign and stuff like that. They've been rallying in West Virginia, but it just it hasn't broken through yet. Yeah. No, anyway. there's at the grassroots. There's a good. There's a lot of great organizations, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. They're trying. They're trying. I don't. I don't begrudge them. It's it's certainly a challenge. Now at the same time. As we have these massive obstacles to anything getting done, we're gonna get blamed. Us on the left for future losses, we're already responsible. Did you know for what's gonna happen this November? Even though our entire thing during Biden's administration has been, you have to deliver on your promises. What part of people can see that you're not doing anything? Do you not understand? We're also being blamed for earlier stuff. So apparently during heated backroom discussions following the 2020 election, South Carolina Representative Jim Clyburn blamed progressives for nearly destroying the Democratic Party's House majority. This is according to a book that's coming out soon. Um, so anyway, he was the House Majority Whip since 2019, previously chair of the House Democratic Conference from 2006 to 2007. So he's influential, he's been a member of the leadership and everything. He said that they had basically in inspiring racialized voting backlash, they had risked losing races that should have been easily won. Look, I would argue that the only reason that Biden was able to squeak by in that relatively narrow election was that progressive pressure caused him to present himself in a far more progressive way than he actually than is actually merited by what he planned to do. It was still close despite that, but they're, they're always blamed. No power, all the blame. No, no legislation as we would craft it. Always the blame for what doesn't get done, Francesca. I mean. Pay attention to what Clyburn is saying and how he's saying it, right? This is a black leader in the Democratic Party basically saying, stop making this about race. You made it too much about race and you're alienating white people. This is the same line that you could hear a Republican say. This is the yeah. centrist line. This is, uh, this is a reactionary line and it actually isn't true. It does not bear out. I mean, I'm sick of repeating this. We're, we were heading into the election. The pandemic had just happened. Bernie's not looking good. Everyone's coalescing around Biden and no one is excited. And then what happens? The George Floyd protests pop off. People mm -hmm. take to the streets en masse, young people, first time voters. And suddenly the entire apparatus around them reveals itself to be as racist as we all knew it was. And yeah. that does actually galvanize people to the polls. It galvanizes people to come out for Georgia. It galvanizes people to make calls. It galvanizes people to send in postcards. Stop this with the BS, you're alienating white voters. Oh, I'm sorry, the largest grow, growing voter block in this country are Asian American voters, then Latino voters. So what are we talking about here? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> hate Clyburn. Yeah, and and look, it's it's they're continuing to try to pitch like progressives as out of touch on the policy, but also even to the extent that they will talk about like race. There was an article I saw. It was about I think they were talking about like Summer Lee and maybe another candidate or two, and they were like, um, these new candidates are redefining uh, progressive away from like white mm -hmm. male. And I thought I get that Bernie was like a big candidate, but I like when I think of like leftist candidates. I don't think of white males. Like, what percentage of them have been? There have been some, certainly. 
but the vast majority, the vast majority are women, the vast majority women of color. Like there seems to be this really slow process where the media gets who these people are, who is <laughs> who are actually the champions of this political movement. Yes. Opportunistically, I would suspect. Anyway, uh, with that opportunistically not recognizing that I mean. We do have to get to one more story with what remains of this hour, so let's jump into this. The option to use active duty forces in a law enforcement role should only be used as a matter of last resort and only in the most urgent and dire of situations. We are not in one of those situations now. I do not support invoking the Insurrection Act. That is the former Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, back in, I believe it was June 3rd of 2020. There had been calls from Republicans to send the military into the streets to put down the George Floyd protesters, and he was against that. Not everyone in the administration was, though. And in fact, he reveals in an upcoming book, because what we do in, in American politics is we sit on incredibly vital information until we can personally profit from it. Uh, that It's coming out on May 10th. The former President Trump said that when demonstrators were filling the streets around the White House following the death of George Floyd, he wanted to do something about it. What was it? Can't you just shoot them? Just shoot them in the legs or something. That's what he said to his Secretary of Defense. Now, mm -hmm. again, as before, I don't want you to be confused. You might be thinking, wait, are you talking about like at the border? No, that was a different time that he said we should be shooting people. He specifically said shoot migrants in the legs to stop them from crossing the border. That was also by the time when he sent this real gem of a tweet. Now the press is trying to sell the fact that I wanted a moot stuffed with alligators and snakes with an electrified fence and sharp spikes on top at our southern border. I may be tough on border security, but not that tough. The press has gone crazy, fake news. No, sources from inside the room say that he was pushing for those things. He wanted an alligator filled moat to yeah. eat migrants as they crossed the border. And then if they got across the moat, then you could shoot him in the legs. He also wanted the George Floyd protesters to be shot in the legs though. So just to be clear, oh, he also wanted the wall to be painted black. So it got really hot and it burned people as they tried to climb across. You can never underestimate how petty and cruel and nasty he is. But no, Francesca, he was telling the Secretary of Defense, why aren't we shooting these protesters? And then they did, they executed a man who was accused of, uh, who was accused of a crime. But Michael Reinhold, if you guys remember, up in Portland, um, I believe it was Portland, it might have been outside of Seattle. But he was shot and killed by US Marshals, never saw a day in court. Okay, great, yeah. they're just not gonna talk about that anymore. Yeah, no, cool, targeted executions, um, yeah, no due process, tight, tight, tight. So yeah, that I think that, and to go to the story we were just talking about, um, this kind of violence, state violence is Absolutely, what we got a glimpse of towards the end of the Trump administration there. Yes, the pandemic and the failure around that, but staring down the barrel of what really a neo fascist militarized state could look like, I think was very galvanizing for folks to turn out to the polls as unexciting as Biden was and has turned out to be in terms of delivering yeah. on anything. But let's not mistake where we've been and where we could so easily slide back to. Yeah, I mean, we're like, like when we read like how many months people have been members or whatever, it's a reminder of how fast this time has like has gone by. Yeah. We're gonna be into that presidential election so quickly and it could result. And the Democrats are doing everything necessary to have it result in this guy or a savvier version of him being in power. And I'll remind you, by the way, we started off with Mark Esper though, who's doing the book. And he said, we're not doing the Insurrection Act. Remember, mm -hmm. he didn't serve out the full rest of the term with Trump. He was yep. fired after the 2020 election. And that scared a lot of people thinking, well, it looks like he's clearing out the people who would be against him using the military. Yep. Then they did the coup, so just bear that in mind. At, like he he can identify the people who are true believers, team players, and who aren't super fast. And his yes, and his then his acting Secretary of Defense actually also didn't deploy the national the, the National Guard because he was also worried that Trump would use them against basically yeah. against Capitol Police. Exactly the the martial law according to Marjorie Green. Anyway, uh, with that said, we are uh, done with our hour. If you're on the podcast or linear platforms, thank you so much for watching. But if you're on the members app, Twitch or YouTube, we do have more coming. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.